morning. Um, today is January 18th, 2023. We will commence um, the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, it looks like we have a quorum. And so um, let's begin this, this uh, hearing. Today we will um, be hearing from me. <laughs> I will be presenting my Senate File 8, which is a supplemental education aid um, bill. And um, there are a lot of people that seem to be very interested in this, this bill. And so we'll be opening that up in just a minute. Members, I would ask that you um, open up the Zoom on your computer. We do have testifiers from um, out state, but we also have a, a number of them here with us today. So in person and via Zoom. And in just one minute, I'm going to turn it over to my vice chair, um, uh, Senator Gustafson, and she will um, take it away. I could just have a moment to log into Zoom and then we will resume here in a moment. All right. Today we have before us uh, Senate File 8. Senator Kunish, you are the chief author and you have the floor. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I think you might need to mute your, your, uh, your computer. Mine's yeah. muted. Uh, we might have one close by that isn't. Okay, I think we've got it. I think we've figured it out now. So. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Today, I would like to present to you um, Senate File 8. It's a supplemental education aid bill. Um, this bill will provide supplemental education funding for school districts through the end of the current fiscal year of 2023. It provides temporary relief to district budgets for, in four different cal cal categories and school expenses. Uh, this bill would appropriate 16.1 million or 100% of school districts and charter school unreimbursed transportation costs from the previous year. It will uh, appropriate $150 million to fully compensate districts for their fiscal year 23 English, learn English language learner cross subsidy or any of the uncompensated costs. It also appro appropriates $100 million in special education cross-subsidy aids to districts. So the total, um, the total special ed cross-subsidy in 2022 was $885 million for all districts. Um, there, the, um, we also are appropriating um, dollars for the nutrition program and um, we don't have the fiscal note on that, but we, uh, by our calculations, it's approximately $180 million. 
So we know that our districts have been suffering, um, especially in the last couple of years with COVID. And as the um, continuing costs of our, our, um, these four programs tend to drain the general funds, this bill is an attempt to repay or backload some of those expenses in order to make sure that we are able to um, support our schools going forward. If the schools didn't have to have the, the um, budget shortage in their general funds, there would be a lot of opportunities uh, to do other programming. And we heard from those students last week about the need and the want for uh, mental health care, not just for themselves, but for their staff. We heard about how um, third grade student would like to go on field trips. We heard so many different ideas of how we can better attend and um, make sure that our students have the best uh, educational opportunities that, they, that we can provide. And this uh, bill, which is a total of just under $500 million, will do just that. So um, the transportation aid part of it, we know that many of our districts travel, um, their bus services or their transportation costs um, are very expensive, especially now that gas prices have gone up. We know that our uh, English learn language learner cross subsidies um, have always been a, a real um, drain on the general fund for our schools as well as the special education funds. And then of course, we hear all the time about how important it is to ensure that our students have nutrition, uh, proper nutrition, in order to learn in their best capabilities. And if we can make that happen for these students, that would, um, that would go a long way. Now, these, this is a one-time only funding. It does not go forward. And um, I would ask that, um, that you all support this bill. We, we have a number of testifiers here, and you should have in front of you um, a very lovely spreadsheet that our our team put together. You might want to pull that out of your, your uh, folder. This is a, a very valuable document to tell you the truth because it breaks down uh, the pupil transportation cost by district, um, the special education cross subsidy, and the English learner cross subsidy. And at this time, I think I would like to ask Ms. Ms. Helseth to please uh, maybe explain the, the, the header up here at the top and then how we can read this best. Ms. Helsa. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. So I am going to go through uh, the, what we call the district run. So on the top left corner, it says SF8 for 20, fiscal year 23 revised. So this shows three of the four components of Senate file eight. Um, again, uh, just a quick summary of columns a shows the district number, uh, column B shows the district name, and then the, the top row, uh, row A shows the state total, and then B through H and then L through N show different stratas, depending on if you want to look how Minneapolis and St. Paul fare compared to, for example, uh, greater Minnesota or charter schools um, versus all districts, metro, greater Minnesota districts. Uh, column C shows the adjusted average daily membership, which is uh, one of the main pupil counts we use. Um, columns D and E are the pupil transportation aid part of this bill. Uh, so right now, Minnesota statute reimburses, uh, on, or, uh, reimburses transportation costs from the prior year at 18.2%. This bill for fiscal year 23 only increases that percent to 100%. So this is just under $16.2 million. And this, uh, this money primarily, it can be used for any general uh, purpose, general fund purpose, but uh, it helps pay for things like gas, gas money. Um, the col our columns F and G are, F, G and H focus on the special education uh, cross-subsidy part of the bill. Column F shows the fiscal year 22 special education cross-subsidy here in the state, uh, which is just under $885 million. Uh, 
this bill appropriates $100 million for all districts, uh, which looks at their fiscal year 22 cross subsidy and evenly appropriates it to, to uh, fare out to that $100 million. And then uh, column H shows the uh, special education cross subsidy aid per uh, that column C, which is $117 per pupil at the state level. Columns I and J show the English learner cross subsidy portion of the bill. Column I shows uh, what the fiscal year 22 English learner cross subsidy was, which was uh, $151.5 million at the state level. And then again, column J shows the 151.5 divided by column C, the 855,000, to get 177 additional dollars per pupil. Uh, and then column K shows the total aid, which adds up columns D, G, and I. And then lastly, column L at, uh, takes that column K, the 267.7 million, and divides it by that 855,000 to get uh, approximately $313 per pupil. And again, you can look through to find which districts you have in your Senate district and to see how your districts fare with this bill. And again, for these three uh, parts of the bill, they all look at fiscal year 22 costs. So this bill uh, reimburses for fiscal year 23 for the entire fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Halseth. Senator Kunish. Um, so as you can see that um, the, the numbers on this uh, spreadsheet are pretty significant in some of our districts and I can only imagine what a difference this would make for our school districts as we start to think of um, coming to the end of the school year, hard to believe, but at the end of the school year, once the legislature starts to allot money is when... Um, when districts start to think about staffing up for next year. And if this could fortify that general fund and schools were able to look at, um, at retaining their teachers, not letting those pink slips go out, um, this would be an extremely valuable way to build that security, build that stability that everybody is asking for. And it's also a really good gesture of uh, support to our schools, to our students, and, um, and that sort of thing. All right, thank you, Senator Kunish. Are we ready to move on to testifiers? Okay. Madam, Madam Chair. Oh, yes, could questions. I just ask a Sen of, yep, Senator Barnesworth. Could, could I you. ask a couple of clarifying questions before, or do I need to wait? Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Kunish. Just, um, so I'm looking at the bill where the blanks are, and I just want to make sure we have the correct numbers, because you had said the total of the bill was uh, around $500 million. So I see with the spreadsheet that you gave us that Transportation was about 16 million. The ELL cross subsidy is 150 million. The special ed cross subsidy is 100 million. Um, the supplemental nutrition is blank. So, approximately, what is the difference? We, um, our estimation is approximately 180 million. Uh, we weren't able to get the fiscal note done in time. So we will we will be laying this this bill over until we get those exact numbers. Uh, it'll be under five hundred thousand. We're we're pretty sure, but approximately that uh, at the end of the day. Okay, Madam Chair. Follow up. I, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and then I'm wondering about the supplemental nutrition. Will this be retroactive for parents that have paid from September first through the day that the bill is is signed into law, or is it? from the date that it's signed into law onward? Um, what this does is it backfills the, the costs of those uh, lunches from based on last year's numbers. And so it, uh, the, the funds would actually go into just the general fund, and then the school would be able to allocate those dollars as they see best within their school district. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And so um, with that, um, the statement you just made, so is all of this is actually just going to the school's general fund, or help me understand if 
like the portion that we're talking about is the um, special education cross subsidy. Is that uh, going to the schools earmarked as that? Um, or is this just strictly, we're calculating off of those numbers, but it's going directly to the school's general fund? It's, this will go to their general fund, recognizing that um, the intent is to um, um, address those, addition, those costs that have been draining their general fund. And so we would, we would hope that our school districts use those, those dollars in the appropriate way under the uh, appropriate um, uh, uses. Thank you. Follow up? All right. Thank you, Senator Kunish. We will move on to our testifiers. Uh, first is John Langard, a superintendent at Worthington School District 518. Um, he's joining us virtually. Welcome, Mr. Langard. Good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to the committee. Um, I just want to cover a few things that for our district, um, the Worthington School District is probably one of the most diverse school districts in the state. And over my 20 year tenure in the district, um, when I started in 2003, um, our diverse population was 34% and we're approximately 77% this year. So when you talk about the drain on the general fund, um, that's exactly what's kind of occurred. When I started in 2023, we had six EL teachers and we're currently at 31 EL teachers. And with that, we are still three teachers short of being staffed, fully staffed in the area of EL. So we're in favor of this bill and the one-time funding. Of course, we would like to see that as ongoing funding um, again, I understand budgetary issues and that's not always, and part of this is I would like to encourage the committee, uh, to consider doing this work early so that we can plan early. We will be looking to start hiring teachers as early as March. And so if the education budgets are done, we don't have to guesstimate, we can plan correctly and appropriately and utilize those funds in a, in, in a supportive manner for our students. Um, one thing that I do want to talk about a little bit is because we're such a diverse uh, school district, we have different needs than many other districts in the state. And it's, it's, it's an awesome part of being a global school district where we have kids from multiple countries that have are a part of our educational system. So with that, we have had challenges where other districts haven't, and it does um, put some strain on our district. But when you one-time fund, we also have to look at how to manage that appropriately so that we don't run into a cliff. And that's why I encourage you to also work to do ongoing funding as part of this. Um, I have asked Sue Hagen, who is our multi-learner coordinator, who has program more specific and some other information to share with you today, who is the second testifier. Um, but I would be very open to questions. I just want you to know we're in support of additional funding, EL funding, as well as the other areas that um, the chair has submitted for this. So we, we really appreciate her commitment to our education and encourage the committee support to move this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Langard. Any questions? All right, seeing none, we'll move to our next testifier, Susan Hagen from Worthington School District, also joining us virtual. Hi, Susan, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Hi, I'm Susan Hagen and I'm the Multilingual Learner Coordinator for the Worthington School District. Um, good morning, members of the Minnesota Education um, Finance Committee. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak this morning. Uh, Worthington is located in the southwest corner of Minnesota and you know we have approximately 14,000 uh, residents. 
Um, our student body population is about 33, is 3,300 students. And the majority of our students' um, home language is Spanish, followed by English, and then 29 other languages. 41% um, of our student body are multilingual learners that require English language development instruction. Uh, providing these students with, this with an equitable education does require a lot of programming. Uh, for example, we currently have 28 EL classes per day at the high school level, and uh, 20 of those are for newcomers and beginners. Um, for example, today uh, we have 11 more newcomers starting at the high school, which is at another third of a classroom. So this additional funding is always very much appreciated. Um, to communicate, um, as Mr. Landgard said, we have 31 um, English language teachers. And then to help communicate and engage these multilingual families, we also have four interpreters, four community connectors and family liaisons, and currently have a posting for an immigrant student li liaison to help our new immigrant students. Um, as you know, the Minnesota LEAPS Act requires us to provide professional development um, to teachers and administrators um, to build their knowledge of academic language acquisition and development, which also requires additional funding. Uh, we are also working on creating more co-teaching opportunities so that our high school students can, um, high school um, English language learners can um, earn credits in content areas rather than just earning um, elective credits in their English language development classes. And this co-teaching model requires additional funding. Um, thank you for bringing this bill forward this funding is necessary to provide our multilingual learners with an equitable education. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Hagen? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, Senator Swazinski. I don't mean to get caught, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I don't mean to get caught in the weeds here, but for um, Ms. Hagen or um, Ms. Land, Mr. Landgard, uh, do you know how many of your EL teachers, ELL teachers, are tier three and four versus tier one? Or is that uh, information you don't have readily available? And I'd understand it if you don't have that information. Sure, I, um, you know, I, I would, I don't have that right in front of me, but um, I, out of the 31, we probably have five that are not tier four, that are, um, they're tier four um, licensed teachers, but not in English language um, development. So they're working on their, to become highly qualified in, in um, and getting that certification in EL. So probably five out of the 31 are not. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Swazinski. Um, all right, thank you, Ms. Hagen. We'll move on to our next testifier, Isaac Lundberg from Moorhead Public Schools. Hi there. Uh, Hi, oh, sorry, please state your name for the record and then you may begin, thank you. Sure, thank you. I'm Isaac Lundberg uh, from Moorhead Schools. I serve as a supervisor um, in our teaching and learning department, uh, specifically uh, with federal programs. Um, and I, I really thank you for the opportunity to share today uh, and thank you for your, your attention to these issues um, that are really important in education. So uh, presently, or, or in Moorhead Schools, we serve around 500 uh, English learners, which represents for us just a little over 7% of our total K-12 enrollment. Um, we have in our school district over 50 different home languages uh, that are that are represented, uh, and then within that, about 25% of those of those English learners are Somali speakers. Um, another 22% uh, speak Kurdish, 
and then followed by Arabic and Spanish as the, the largest language groups within uh, our school district. Um, so, so right now, basic skills revenues for English learners account for approximately 20% of our EL programming expenditures. Um, just to kind of speak to the, the, the general fund issue for us. So the remaining 80% then is a, is a general fund uh, expense. So in Moorhead, we have some Title III funds as well that uh, support for us uh, primarily family engagement efforts and then some supplemental curricular resources. Uh, I, I do think, uh, as we're talking about this, um, any, any public opportunity to, to thank our teachers and our, our passionate staff who, who work uh, on these issues and, and with our EL students and, and all of our students is really important. Um, so our EL kids show really a tremendous amount of growth, um, <clears throat> excuse me, as a result of their work. And I think it's really important to note that um, we, we really firmly believe that uh, the contributions of our English learners to our school communities significantly outweigh uh, the costs for programming. Um, however, there are a number of ways that we are very much challenged in the work that we do, uh, particularly in terms of appropriately resourcing the needs. Uh, so to speak to uh, those needs a little bit, I think it's important to recognize that uh, English learners as a as a category um, within that category there's there's tremendous diversity so of those 50 different languages that are spoken within our district um, over 20 of those have fewer than a handful of speakers and so often that means for us just one family in our in our district who speaks a particular language and oftentimes for those those larger groups that I mentioned earlier, we are able to uh, staff individuals who, who speak that language um, uh, or those languages of, of kind of those larger communities within our school district. But it's really, really tough to find a way to meet the communication needs um, of all of the different families that we serve. Um, so kind of with that, a few a few specifics that are that represent challenges for us. Uh, I think always the biggest the biggest uh, challenge will be meeting the diverse needs of uh, the diverse academic needs of English learners. So our ability to provide enough specialized instruction for them, um, as well as provide appropriate supports in the within the mainstream classroom, um, is 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 always kind of the battle battle in the in the. The thing we have to figure out in terms of uh, appropriating resources for us um, a huge uh, growth area for us is family and community engagement and continuing to bridge communication and understanding between <laughs> school and home um, in our school district in our school district we have a somali liaison and then a kurdish and arabic uh, speaking liaison, but really that's not enough. And finding a way to, to partner with our families is really essential. Um, another issue or need that we're seeing is the, uh, the need for culturally sensitive mental health and behavior supports. Um, our, oftentimes within some of these communities, we see uh, resistance to, to uh, those supports that we have built in. So finding a way to, again, bridge that, that communication gap to best serve those students. And then uh, finally, we think that some, some extended day programming and, and experiential learning is really important for that particular community um, so that we can provide some additional background knowledge uh, and connections and context for their learning to really uh, hook in what's happening to the classroom, to the, to the larger world around them. Uh, and sometimes our, our English learners don't have the same access to some of those things that some of our other uh, students do. So um, the proposal that you're considering would uh, allow us to continue to work through some of those concerns, uh, as well as uh, really alleviate the squeeze on our general fund to provide some of those programmings. So I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you uh, and would also be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lundberg. Any questions for Mr. Lundberg? All right, seeing none, and as a graduate of Moorhead State, thank you so much. <laughs> We're moving on to uh, Mr. Kent Packel, or Peckel, I'm sorry, Superintendent of Rochester Public Schools joining us virtually. Uh, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Thank you very much, I'm Kent. I 
pronounce it Pekel, but my grandparents said Peckle, so you can say whatever, and I'm superintendent um, here in Rochester Public Schools. Um, I also want to strongly endorse this proposal to increase funding. In Rochester, we're using the term multi-language learner, and the logic there is that we want these kids not only to become not just proficient, but to really master English language, but we want them also to be proficient in their home language, because we know that prepares them, and by extension, Minnesota, to thrive in a global economy. 9.7% um, of our students in Rochester are multi-language learners or English language learners. That's just about the state average of 8.9%. So you can sort of see Rochester as um, uh, indicative of the state as a whole. And we have, I've only been here in Rochester for the last year and a half, and we have, as part of our larger academic strategy, launched a really aggressive uh, initiative to support and strengthen the academic uh, outcomes that our um, English language learners achieve. That, that effort is being led by our a new position we created um, that's been filled by Natalia Benjamin, who um, was Minnesota Teacher of the Year in 2021. Um, and uh, should the committee ever be interested, I know Natalia would be a great person to join you to talk about that work. But at the core of our strategy is we know from a lot of research that those multi-language learners do better, not when they're sequestered off only with other kids whose first language is not English, but when they're in a co-teaching setting. And you heard about that in uh, Worthington. And so we are going to be leaning into that really strongly. We also know that multi-language learners benefit from additional social emotional supports. Some of them are coming from uh, situations where they're entirely new to the country. Others live in homes and communities where, frankly, they need additional supports to do school well in a U.S. context. And then finally, we also know from a lot of research that if they have some core proficiency in their first language, their uh, success in English will be faster and better. And that kind of makes sense if you think about if you don't know grammar in your home language, learning grammar in English is a heavy lift. And so those are just a few examples of the kind of best practices we're working to put in place. And the fact that at least uh, as I've been following this, the basic funding and concentration revenue in Minnesota for EL students has not increased in almost a couple of decades, really hampers our ability and other districts' ability to implement those kind of effective practices. In Rochester, that means our, our services for EL students have, for the last uh, few years, including pre-pandemic, have been at about $4.5 million each year, and our state aid has been at about $1.2 million, and that has resulted in that consistent shortfall or cross-subsidy of about $3.3 million, and as the Senator noted at the outset, those are dollars from the general fund that could be used for other purposes that we reallocate to support those multi-language learners. So um, this is one-time uh, funding. We think it's a great start over time. Uh, this critical funding stream, I would hope, would be indexed to the general fund, which would have a reasonable uh, connection to inflationary increases, and I know that's not our subject today. Um, I want to just make one other final point, and this might be kind of a wonky policy point, but I think it's very important for state leaders like you to also be thinking about the even bigger picture than a categorical funding stream like, like this. If you look at the highest performing educational systems in the world, whether it's Finland or Singapore or British Columbia and Canada, their defining feature is that they're coherent. The system makes sense. The standards are aligned with the curriculum, are aligned with professional development, are aligned with testing and assessment, are aligned with accountability systems, are aligned with student supports. And the need for coherence also applies to funding. You know, there's back from the 1970s in Watergate, this idea of follow the money. And following the money in education also matters too. And if our funding streams don't clearly connect to the outcomes we see our kids needing to achieve and the practices we expect our students to master, we've got a system that's very incoherent. And so in this area, as in special education, in Minnesota, we, um, you know, Rob Peter to pay Paul um, to the tune of millions and millions of dollars every year. And what that does is it really diminishes the state's ability to say to district leaders like me, um, these are your goals. This is where we expect you to get with multi-language learner proficiency. And these are the kind of practices that you should be um, instituting. Um, and so there's lots and lots of reasons for that. There's local control. There's the fact that we really have very little capacity at our State Department of Education to drive and support best practice. But I think the funding stream is another example of how going forward, if we are going to start to make progress in Minnesota on raising achievement overall and closing gaps between student groups, which candidly we have not done in recent years, we have got to think about a coherent system 
where the pieces make sense. And I think with this legislation before you, you could take a meaningful step forward to uh, connect the funding to the services and the outcomes that we seek to achieve with a critical and growing part of our student population in Minnesota. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Seeing none, we'll move to Mary Palmer, middle school English teacher, uh, ling I'm sorry, English language development teacher at Shakopee, who's joining us in person. You may state your name for the record and begin when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Mary Palmer, and I teach in Shakopee Public Schools. Um, I teach in the middle school level, grades six through eight. Is that better? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and the committee members for allowing me to speak to you all again on the topic of the needs of multilingual learners in the state of Minnesota. Let me first start off by thanking Chair Kunish and for bringing Senate File 8 to the committee and proposing a one-time funding of ML departments to help eliminate the cross-subsidy de deficit that schools across Minnesota currently have. In my district of Shakopee, that means that $1,796,839 would be added to our general fund budget. That has an impact, not only on our ML learners, but on students across the district, as those added funds will be able to provide additional programming and also support staff who work directly with students. I also look forward to future discussions about how necessary it is to fully fund EL departments consistently in the future. Today, I hope to tell you about the students and classrooms this funding will directly benefit today and then hopefully for years to come. Shakopee currently has 1,117 ML students enrolled, but that number changes almost daily. In my middle school building alone, we have had eight, new student, eight students new to the United States start within the last four months. While I was testifying here last week, I received an email alerting me to get another new student to the United States that started yesterday. I originally wanted to tell you a story of one or two individual students who could really pull at your heartstrings and help you visualize why this funding is so important. The problem is, it isn't important to just one or two students. Fully funding ML in just my building would mean that 108 ML students would, would, would get the more individualized support at every step along their academic and English acquisition journey. That individualized support would help close the academic gap that ML students often find themselves in. Proficient in social English, but falling behind in their ability to use English in an academic setting. Currently, our building has two full-time ML teachers with over 50 students on our caseloads. We teach two co-taught ML classes per grade level, and those classes are made up of almost 50% ML students. Best practice tells us that we should only have about 25 or 30 students in each class next to their grade level peers. These facts are striking, but everything I've said so far today has just been numbers. Let me tell you what that means for students who are learning English in our Minnesota classrooms. Students who have just entered the United States have the highest needs in a grade level classroom. In co-taught US history, that looks like the ML teacher translating documents, readings, assignments, and assessments, and hoping that Google Translate doesn't mess it up too much. It looks like providing picture support for words like red coats or cotton gin or the Rocky Mountains. It looks like pre-teaching who Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was or what happened at the first Thanksgiving. It means sitting next to students helping navigate technology that is so necessary for their futures, not just in academics, but in their future working lives. Students that are considered ready for grade level English classes are the largest number of ML students we see. They have progressed to the point that they have the conversational or social English, but cannot read grade level texts and have holes in their vocabulary related to math and science, including the academic language that is present, uh, presented in all courses. These are the students who are impacted the most by a lack of funding in schools. They require less hands-on support daily, 
but need that final targeted push of English language development to perform at the level that they are cognitively capable and ready for, but do not have the language skills to support. It is these students that fall between the cracks in classes because there is simply not enough resources or support to bridge the gap between social and academic English. This is the gap that leads students to failing grades, loss of motivation, and dropping out before graduation. This gap poses immediate problems for a student's future in terms of academic or financial success. However, this lack of English language support becomes a generational issue when students are not able to achieve at their highest potential because they did not have the support they needed to succeed when they needed it most. With the historic surplus that the state of Minnesota currently has available, you all have a once in a generation opportunity to change the futures for ML students and families all across Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Palmer. Any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you so much. Our next uh, testifier is Superintendent Chris Lennox. If he, once you get to the mic, if you want to state your name for the record, and then you may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Chris Lennox. I am the superintendent for Moundsview Public Schools. Uh, and today I am here to testify on Senate File 8, specifically uh, in support of the Special Education Cross Subsidy Aid. A um, little bit about Moundsview Public Schools. We are a district in the North Metro. Uh, we serve the cities of Arden Hills, uh, New Brighton, North Oaks, Moundsview, Shoreview, and parts of Roseville and Vadness Heights. Our enrollment is just over 11,000 students, which makes us the 10th largest school district in the state. Uh, as for our demographics, 40% of our students are students of color. 34% qualify for free and reduced price lunch. 8% of our students are learning English as a second language. And 11% of our students are receiving special education services. And on the run you had uh, presented to you today, you can see that the Moundsview special education cross subsidy is currently uh, six million, a little more than six million dollars. And if you compare that to the state, or even the metro, which I know is in excess of 400 million dollars for their cross subsidy, six million dollars might not seem like a very big number. But for context, I can tell you that in Moundsview, $6 million is nearly 7% of the general education aid that our district receives from the state. So even when money is put on the formula, which is our primary source of revenue and greatly appreciated, in Moundsview, we're immediately taking that 7% and moving it over to cover expenses related to special education because those special education um, has not been fully funded. And while I, I certainly want to be uh, in support of all the testimony that came before with uh, the EL cross subsidy, special ed cross subsidy is equally important. Um, and I would like to see ongoing funding dedicated to covering both of those cross subsidies, certainly the special ed cross subsidies, but the one-time money that's being looked at in Senate File 8 is desperately needed and can immediately be put to use serving our students. As an example, I, I know as mentioned before, you heard from students, like many districts, we have increased student needs. The last several years, we've heard from students, we know there are needs providing them additional support and mental health services. It's one area that comes to mind almost immediately when you talk uh, to educators about what we could do with this additional money. If we could free up the money from the cross subsidy, there are just any number of things uh, we could do. I know districts are already adjusting budgets in the area of student support and mental health, uh, and arguably that would help not only Moundsview, but freeing up that money uh, for districts across the state to provide these services. Another area of need is instructional support. Focusing our resources on meeting our students' academic needs is incredibly important. 
as well as sustaining programs that are already in place to support them. Those programs can be put at risk when more and more we have to pull money in a cross subsidy away from those programs to serve the educational um, special ed cross subsidy. Now in Mound's view, one area we put a great deal of time and effort into is building a strong and vibrant concurrent enrollment program. In fact, this past school year at graduation, we had 22 students, nearly two dozen who graduated with an Associate of Arts college degree in addition to their high school diploma. But programs like these get put at risk when we have to immediately move $6 million or 7% of our education aid annually to cover those special ed education needs. Addressing the special ed cross subsidy would be a great way to stabilize not only this program, but many programs that would go to support students and continue to provide them with opportunities well into the future. With that, I would like to thank you for your time today. I appreciate the opportunity to share my support for Senate File 8. I hope you can find your way to supporting this legislation and passing it, addressing the special education cross-subsidy and providing these much-needed funds to our students and our schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, okay. <laughs> Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for coming today. Actually, my first, uh, my student teaching was done at Moundsview High School. My first teaching job was also at Moundsview High School. Go Mustangs. Um, so thank you for the start. Um, so my question has to do with your specific cross-subsidy. Cross and um, so the state average per student cross-subsidy is around $1,000. Mounds view it looks like is 558 and this isn't a criticism I'm actually curious about how you keep your cross subsidy so much lower um, you know some are as high as 2,000 some are it appears as low as 300 you know three to four hundred and so I'm just sort of curious about if there's anything innovative that you're doing at Mounds view that maybe you know we could learn learn about because that seems you know obviously it's half of the state average sure um. Madam Chair, members of the committee. Senator, I, I would uh, love to have an in-depth conversation about that. One of the things I think we have taken great pride in in Mounds View is uh, really making sure that we're uh, providing the services to each and every student at their need level. So some um, times students are looked to to qualify for special education and affix that label. Um, we think there are opportunities and times where we can provide services and not necessarily have a student be labeled or have an, an IEP. We can still provide services. So I think you would find in our system that that's happening often and regularly. So that we may not be qualifying as many students for special education. Uh, we have stayed pretty consistent around 11% of our students qualifying for special education, even as enrollment has grown. So we take a really close look at what the needs are for all students, meet the needs of each student, uh, not necessarily having to assign them to an IEP or qualify them for special ed to meet their needs. So, but happy to talk more about that with myself or my team in the future. Senator Farnsworth, follow up? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, that actually led to my next question because your, your overall percentage of, of special ed numbers is below the state average. Um, the response to intervention targets at least 17 years ago when I did my graduate work on on interventions in special ed said that it, that a district should be around 13 to, to 15 percent that's sort of the the best practice target and you're and you're below that so my next question was going to have to do with um, the you know how robust your interventions are you know before special ed and part of the reason that I wanted to ask that and we can have a separate question is that I sort of want to keep bringing this up when we're talking about special education is I think we need to look at having um, statewide better intervention systems. I think it's very inconsistent from district to district. So if you could just sort of explain um, what your district is doing, because obviously you're doing something right, keeping those numbers you know, where statistically they, they probably should be. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Senator, I, I think uh, I personally, a little biased, but feel we have a very robust um, process, uh, multi-tiered systems of support 
um, is uh, the systems in place. We work very hard at all of our schools to make sure that we have programming in place and staff in place to support uh, our students. That's an ongoing commitment to do that. Um, we don't have the time today to get into all of the detail of that, but would be happy to have myself and my team uh, sit with anyone who may be interested to talk about how we're supporting our students and the, the services we're providing. But uh, those start as early as pre-K. Uh, we're supporting students from, from birth, actually birth to pre-K, and all, all the way through uh, graduation and beyond. So uh, arguably a very robust system. Um, but would be happy to talk about more of the detail um, at a future time. Senator Farnsworth, follow-up? No? Senator Rarick, did you have a question? Oh, I thought I saw your hand. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Um, our final, or I'm um, sorry, our next testifier is uh, Leah Gardner. Uh, please state your name for the record when you are ready to speak, and you may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, members. My name is Leah Gardner. I am Policy Director at Hunger Solutions Minnesota. And uh, I also am representing the Hunger Free Schools Coalition, and that is a diverse coalition of business, healthcare leaders, nonprofit and advocacy groups, education and youth advocates, uh, just to name a few. And we're all united in the cause to make sure that all students have access to breakfast and lunch at school. So with the rapid uh, rise in the price of food that I'm sure we all are aware of, um, and then also the loss of temporary federal relief that has been supporting families, we're seeing more families than ever experiencing food insecurity. So, um, we have a record high number of food shelf visits happening right now. We have uh, in the last full year um, in 2022, we're looking at uh, approximately 2 million more visits to food shelves in Minnesota than we've seen prior. Um, so was about 3.6, it probably will go above 5.6 um, when, when we're done with our final counts. Um, those are the numbers. I think the human beings uh, within that are, are even more important to recognize. Uh, and what it really means is that we, no doubt, in my mind, have more hungry kids in our schools than we've ever had in recent history, including the last recession. Um, that's, that's our reality. And after two years of being able to provide school meals for all students, Returning to the broken system of asking parents who can't afford to pay for those meals to do so is causing significant hardship for families, uh, for students, and for schools. I think you can ask just about any school how it's going, um, making that transition back. It's been really tough. What it means for students and how this might look in your district and in the schools is may be difficult to see. You might see students choosing not to eat, right? The reason they're doing that isn't because they're not hungry, it's because they know their parents would get a bill that they can't afford to pay right now. So you will see students skipping those meals because they're concerned about the price. You will also see students where the meals they are getting at school are the only nutritious meals that they might be able to count on that day. Um, so this is our reality right now. Um, it's, like I said, hard to overstate how tremendous the need is. And that is why we are so grateful for Senate File 8 which would provide immediate relief to those struggling to provide breakfast and lunch to all of our students. Um, it just is so needed, urgently needed, and will be very meaningful um, for our schools and our families all across the state. So I thank you very much for your time and attention to this issue. Thank you, Ms. Garner. Any questions? 
All right, seeing none, thank you so much. We'll move to our next testifier, Mr. Massey. Please uh, come to the mic. And when you are ready, please state your name for the record and you may begin. Good morning, Steve Massey, Superintendent for Forest Lake Area Schools. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Santa File 8 and specifically the Transportation Sparsity Aid. I have visited many of your offices over the year advocating on behalf of this particular issue and it's exciting to see that it has um, risen to this level of priority. Forest Lake Area Schools is a district just 25 miles north of, of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Our district covers approximately 220 square miles with an enrollment just under 6,000 students. Transportation, as you are aware, is based on student enrollment, not the miles a district must drive to transport students. Consequently, districts with a large geography and a dispersed and dispersed housing, like Forest Lake, Bemidji, and some 80 other school districts, must offset their transportation costs from their general fund, creating a cross subsidy. Specifically, Forest Lake draws between $300,000 and $500,000 each year from the general fund to cover the transportation deficit. To offset this cost, we have reduced eight routes in the last number of years, resulting in longer bus routes for <coughs> students. In fact, we have some students on buses for over two hours each day. The issue is an issue of fairness and equity. Half a million dollars for Forest Lake is equivalent to seven to eight teachers or <coughs> critical services we are not able to provide for our students. Even as a bill that provides one-time relief on this transportation sparsity issue, it is greatly appreciated. Like each of the last number of years, we are hoping to have a bill that provides permanent relief on this issue before this committee at the, uh, this session. In fact, we just received our Senate file number that will be Senate file three, uh, three, uh, 319, uh, which will hopefully provide ongoing relief on this issue. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I would stand for any questions. Thank you, uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, Breen, you brought up transportation. This, the question isn't necessarily for you, Superintendent. I believe it's for our staff, but as I look at the runs, um, I see a number of schools that have nothing in the transportation area. Um, and a, a large number of them are very rural schools that have a lot of transportation needs. Can you help me understand why they might have, so many school districts would have a zero in that transportation? And then I suppose at the same time, I think probably a little more obvious, but the English learner uh, section as well. Ms. Halseth. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator, for your question. So as for the people transportation aid, uh, districts report those costs to MDE. So that's where that data comes from the prior year. So it's just what um, districts are reporting. So if they have less gas costs, that, that's where that data is coming from. So Forest Lake has higher costs, which is why they're being reimbursed more um, for this specific funding stream. And then for the English learner, again, it's based off prior year costs and what districts are reporting for their expenditures and then what they're getting um, for revenue. And then it's the diff difference between those two. Mr. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So if a school district is working well to try to make um, those areas work and they're not reporting that as a cross-subsidy problem, they're not going to be reflected in this, whereas another school district um, reports that and it's going to show up uh, and it's going to be a little bit of an unbalance between what a school district might get um, if we're just looking at what they reported. Is that correct? Ms. Halseth. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator, for the follow-up question. Yes, I would say that's pretty accurate because it's based on what districts are reporting uh, for their prior year costs. Thank you. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. or Senator Farnsworth. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just looking at your transportation um, information, I'm wondering, does this include special transportation for students in special ed, or would that fall under your, your special ed cross-subsidy, this, no, this 437000 Madam Chair, uh, uh, I, that would fall under the transportation component. So transportation does offset some of that, but largely that's in the transportation um, budget. And I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. Um, I'm guessing you don't have the numbers of as far as this 437,000, what percentage of that might be special education, special transportation versus just the you know regular bus routes. Um, if you don't have that, that's that's okay. Or if you have a ballpark. Yeah, the ballpark, uh, Madam Chair, that I would provide is we have 61 routes today. That's actually down from 68 a couple of years ago. 15 of those routes are special education routes. Any other questions? Senator Kunish, this bill is a supplemental education bill that goes into general funds, correct? This is not uh, meant for anything specific cross-subsidy or, or specific need. It goes into their general fund. Is that correct? That is correct. It um, would all go into the general fund, and that would uh, allow the schools to use those dollars in the best way possible. Thank you. We have a final testifier. Um, Jim Grathwald, um, please step to the mic. When you're ready, state your name for the record, and you may begin. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. My name is Jim Grathwald, representing St. Paul Public Schools, and, we, and I'm also speaking for a number of associations, statewide associations. I'm going to just go through that list for you. Um, MSBA, Minnesota School Boards Association, MASA, the Minnesota Association, Minnesota Association of School Administrators, MREA, Minnesota Rural Education Association, MAPT, Minnesota Association of Public Transportation, MASA, Minnesota, I've already done, the Principals Associations, Elementary and Secondary Principals Association, Association of School Budget Officers, uh, Association of Metropolitan School Districts, Minneapolis Schools, St. Paul Schools, and the Schools for Equity and Education. So a ragtag band of uh, education associations who strongly support um, this bill and thank uh, Senator Kunesh for bringing this forward. Um, I come from a, um, well, I'm new to representing St. Paul schools. I have a little history with the, uh, having represented Minneapolis schools pre previously, Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, and having been on staff here. But to, to just bring it home, um, we're building a school system for the 21st century while still trying to pay bills for mandates put in place in a previous century. Special education, um, English language learner or multicultural language learners. What I, we're really good at admiring the problem here and I, um, when we talk about a special ed or an, a, any kind of cross subsidy, we have data that says we're not putting enough resources into um, a problem that we know we need to solve. Um, and I believe we have knowledge in parts a duty to act. So when we look at the spreadsheet and we see these numbers, I want you to think about a state constitutional mandate to fund and adequately resource a system of public education. What the group, uh, what St. Paul Schools and the associations I've mentioned love about this bill is it actually recognizes and, and acts upon the basis of that knowledge, that we need to do something about it. Um, this is one-time money, and it's for one fiscal year, FY23. The governor's budget recommendations and bills you'll be hearing tomorrow are going to be addressing that 24-25 problem. But if it's a problem in 24-25, it's a problem this year as well. It was a problem last year and for previous decades. So what we really appreciate is uh, this committee, this um, body, and the legislature in its entirety finding the will to act on the basis of the knowledge that they have a duty to fund public education and ad adequately resource it. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.
Um, and with that, I will ask Senator Kunish what her intention is with the spill. So once again, um, members, uh, uh, because we still have not received that fiscal note, we will be laying this over and we will be working on um, fine tuning it to the best that we can. Thank you. We do have a question, Senator Lucero. Uh, not a question, but we are laying it over. Um, I do have an amendment I'd like to offer. We're not taking amendments? Not today. Okay. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Kunish, is it, uh, would you like to have some discussion amongst the committee on the thoughts, or do we want to uh, wait with that as well till we ha have all of the numbers and um, to bring it back to the committee? I would be happy to have a discussion here and now if you have some thoughts about what we've heard, you know, what you know about your district and across the state. It can only help us to, you know, create an even better bill. So go ahead. Yeah, Senator you, Eric. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Senator Kunish. Um, I guess um, what I want to start with as we look at the, the runs here on the sheet, um, there, and I guess I want to start by saying I think we all know the needs in talking to our school districts, um, the issues they're having with their funding sources, and they're in need of some help. Um, as I look at this, I see a wide range. Um, Lanesboro is going to receive $2 per student in support in this, and then others are receiving, you know, over $800. Um, and we, I hear about that from my districts a lot, about the disparities, and that's where I'm, I brought up the transportation piece. If you look at page two, um, districts 91 to 100, um, those are all schools in my uh, district. Um, Carleton, who has reported a transportation issue, is getting $398. All of the other districts there um, are receiving less than 100, except for Renshaw, a little over 100. But yet, I don't know, uh, Barnum especially has been talking to me about the transportation needs that they have. So it just, to me, it feels like they're not, they haven't reported their need there, and they've maybe been doing things to make that work. And now the way we're doing this and formulas tend to. Um, not treat everyone equally. And so I guess I'm hoping as we move this forward, we're going to look at some options that will more evenly distribute uh, the money to school districts because I know they all have needs. And that's why I, I think our caucus and I uh, spoke yesterday, I just, the special education cross subsidy to me is the, um, I think the number one priority when we look down the list on these runs, every school district has a number there, where not every school district has the other runs. And then I guess just the other one, as we look at it, um, I heard um, one of the testifiers say that the approximate state average um, is 8.9% for English learners. And we saw the other day it's 16.9% uh, for special education. Yet the numbers are higher that we're putting in this from this bill into English learner, which to me seems we're, we'd be helping more schools in a more equitable way if we're putting more into the special education rather than English learners. So I, I hope we'll have some of those discussions as to where the numbers should be to help balance what these numbers are per school district as we move forward. So thank you. Senator Kunish. Um, thank you, Senator Rarick. I, I, I really do get what you're saying here. And it's really hard to, to look down the list and see you know, no additional dollars going towards transportation or some of these other um, items. We, you know, we needed to start somewhere. We needed to do something. And we have, this is the data that we have to, to base those dollars off at this time. Um, because this is a one-time funding source, um, we will be looking at long-term and maybe permanent funding so that we don't have to come back and backfill all of this, these dollars. Uh, we can't always be equal. Um, you know, we have to look at uh, where the, the districts and which districts seem to be most in need and help them out. And then we can go back and, and look at what we can do statewide to support those schools. Follow up. Senator Farnsworth. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Kunish. Um, so one of the things I like about what 
um, this bill is attempting to accomplish is that this is going into the general fund. And the reason I like that is I've had meetings with superintendents, superintendent groups, and they say what they need is flexibility. And so I like that, um, you know, for instance, the the nutrition aid. I like that that's going to the to the general fund um, because you know different. You know, my my school district in Hibbing has. Uh, a lot different needs than maybe Minneapolis does, and so they can they can use that where they need it. But I just I sort of want to echo what um, Senator Rarick was saying, and you know, looking at looking at this list, Minneapolis and St. Paul will be getting eight hundred and thirty eight dollars per student, and you look at the smaller Greater Minnesota schools, they're looking at about one hundred and forty nine, and their needs are different, but I, I would say that the gravity of their needs are just as important as the needs of, of Minneapolis and St. Paul. So, um, and, and of course, I've been in the special ed world for, for 17 years, and so that sort of would be where my preference is. And having worked in that, I, I would agree that um, if we were to put all of this funds on the special ed cross subsidy, every single school would do better. Minneapolis, St. Paul, the metro schools would still receive a greater portion because they have more students, and that's reasonable. But the smaller schools, and, and a lot of these smaller schools are really struggling because they don't have the resources. I mentioned last week or two weeks ago when we talked about grants, a lot of these schools don't get the grants because they can't afford a grant writing specialist, whereas Minneapolis and St. Paul probably have professional grant writing specialists. And so putting this money on the cross subsidy that they can put in their general fund um, really helps the smaller school districts that don't get those grants. So I would, we want to help, we want to help school districts. We know there's a huge need. We know that mental health um, has, has uh, ex, you know, those these problems have exploded. But I would say um, that that we need to, I, I think, uh, for the purposes of this, put it on the special ed cross subsidy. Um, the other thing that I did want to mention, I just looked at the, um, the ELL cross subsidy and the Greater Minnesota school schools that testified today, um, and I looked up a couple of other ones. So Hutchinson, Wilmer, Austin, Worthington, Moorhead. Those are those are school districts with large numbers of ELL needs, and so they sort of drive up that percentage uh, that the Greater Minnesota schools of 2,000 or more get. Um, I don't have the numbers, but I suspect if we were to take those, you know, five the five or six biggest Greater Minnesota schools out of that formula, then the greater Minnesota schools of, of 2,000 or more would probably drop from that 264, I would guess, and be closer to the 150 to 160 range that the rest of greater Minnesota is at. So, so again, to me, that sort of reinforces the, the thought that it goes to the, to the general fund, which is, I think, a great idea. But um, I think just, you know, for, to have, the, have there be a little bit more parity, have it go through the, the uh, special ed cross-subsidy um, but I, in general, I like the idea of, of it going into the general fund. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Farnsworth. Um, I have a question for our staff. If you could explain maybe the parameters of special education funding, that would be maybe helpful to the discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gustafson um, and committee members. Um, I believe you are asking about the maintenance of financial support requirement. Yes, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, so the maintenance of financial support requirement that we discussed in committee yesterday is a federal requirement uh, that requires the state of Minnesota to provide at least the same level of support for special education services as it did in the year prior. Um, if you look at your state aid appropriation tracker, you can see that from year to year, special education aid grows by approximately $100 million per year. Uh, it's slightly over. Uh, and as a result, I believe that is uh, how the amount was selected for this bill, the $100 million for fiscal year 2023, uh, because the state can provide that much additional funding without binding the hands of future or of the current legislature from setting the appropriations for fiscal year 2024. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any other discussion or questions? Senator Westland, you, and then um, Senator Kroon after that. 
Madam Chair, and just as a comment, we will be hearing the special ed funding bill tomorrow, and um, uh, I am pleased to hear that many of my colleagues find that this is a very important thing that we fund, that we do fund it equitably around the state, that we make sure that all of our kids um, who do have special needs get the education that they need and they require and that they deserve um, to be their best selves. Uh, my son uh, received special education services from um, pre-K all the way through graduation, and it made all the difference in his life. So this is very important to me, and I look forward to that discussion tomorrow. Thank you. Senator Cruin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd just like to echo some of the comments um, we've heard today, and I'll say the same thing generally that I said at the AMSD event a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'd like to see... Um, more of a priority go to, towards the special education cross-subsidy. Every district in our state has unique needs. I think that's one thing. Um, the testimony we've been hearing over the last few hearings uh, confirms. But the one pressing need that every single district in this state has is the special ed education cross-subsidy. And um, I, I like that as a priority because every single dollar that every district receives on that cross-subsidy frees up a dollar from their general fund so that they can use those funds um, and have the flexibility to use those funds um, in the way that is unique to that district and their needs. Um, one concern I do have, and Senator Rarick touched on this, I, I'm, I don't have a lot of confidence in the, uh, the transportation cross-subsidy right now. It seems like there's some self-reporting issues going on and that not every district in this state um, is using, um, is playing under the same rules when it comes to that. I, I have some real concerns about that, and I don't doubt the, the unique needs that um, Forest Lake schools have, which um, part of Forest Lake schools is in my district. And I, I know in Columbus, for example, I can imagine what the transportation challenges are in Columbus. But if we were to funnel under this uh, bill more money towards the special education cross subsidy, even Forest Lake would do come out much better than they would trying to uh, use the transportation um, funds here. And then they, Forest Lake, could use um, that flexibility that would be free up in their general fund towards their transportation needs if that's how they choose to do it. So that's just my general comment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruin. Any other discussion or questions before? Oh, Senator Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Kunish, for bringing this forward. It's been a really, um, the presenters today were really eye-opening. I kept trying to think of the proper metaphor. Um, I, I, I haven't come up with one except for maybe um, may, calling 911 and somebody answers that call. You know somebody's going to come, whether it's um, um, EMS or firefighters or police, but somebody will come. And right now our schools are sending out a 911 call that th these kids are showing up at our doors. And whether they're hungry or language um, um, learners or, um, or, or need to have um, uh, a safe and reliable bus show up at their door to take them to their school. They're nonetheless, they're, they're, they're showing up and they're there and they're hungry and they're ready to learn and um, we need to help them as much as possible and help all the educators in this great state. So thank you, um, Senator Kunish. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? All right. Uh, with that, I will invite Senator Kunish to retake her uh, role as chair. And we'll give her a moment to join us and then continue. Thank you. Well done, Senator Gustafson. Thank you for uh, taking over today and, and taking us through this important bill. As you heard, the need is, is real. The, uh, the effects of 
uh, draining those funds out of a out of the general fund uh, has really serious consequences to our students and to our school communities. And our attempt to um, to kind of make whole or to say thank you to our school districts, um, I hope will not go unnoticed. Uh, if there is nothing else, I think we um, have completed our task here today. Uh, tomorrow we will be hearing Senate File 21 and Senate File 28, which also highlight or focus on the uh, English language cross-subsidy as well as the um, special ed cross-subsidy. And we'll be looking forward to another in-depth discussion. So with that, members and uh, guests, we are adjourned. Thank you.